This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey, this is Brian Peña. I always join the Vito Vacas, the best Vacas in the United States. In this episode of Tigers Talk is brought to you by The Athletic, premium coverage for passionate Detroit sports fans. Tigers Talk listeners can get 20% off the first year of an annual subscription by visiting theathletic.com slash DSP. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the first 2018 edition of Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. I am still here. Sad but true for a lot of you listeners out there for the DOC. John Charles Macaroon in studio with me as usual after a week off from Tiger's Talk for John. And he did Doc and Jock with Adam, but uh, refused to do a Tiger's Talk recording with me because he just doesn't respect or love me enough. But all joking aside, he is here with me in studio. Happy New Year to you, John. And how are you doing? Shout out to you and Dom. A great Tigers Talk edition. Listen, man, it's another great year, 2018. Looking forward to podcasting, looking forward to talking about baseball because I really do believe this might be one of the most challenging years you and I have watching baseball in that victories are going to be few and far between for our home baseball club, the Detroit Tigers. But we still got a chance to kind of look at how we got here, how the Tigers are going to perform in a new way because you know, prior to everybody was used to spending money, bringing in talent, playing winning baseball. At this point in time, it's going to be different. But if there's anybody that's in the know, it's you. I know that you love baseball. You and Dom broke it down. I respected, you know, the comparisons between the Detroit Tigers and the Chicago White Sox. And it was a very fascinating podcast. Every time you pick up the microphone, something interesting happens. That's why we have you here. You can check out Vito's work Every single week, every Wednesday and Saturday, and then periodically with his interview specials, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. I'm looking forward to kicking off 2018 here with you talking some baseball. And I guess to start off, I was interested in kind of looking at, you know, one of the big major storylines for the year 2018 for the Tigers, the minor league system, because there's a plethora of talent in the minors right now in Toledo, in Lakeland, Double A. Lots of talent right now, kind of you know, going to be looked upon to kind of evolve. And then there's going to be some shakeups in terms of bringing up this young talent throughout 2018, whether it be through injury, whether it be for great performances. It's going to be fascinating to look at some of the talent, but only recently has the minor league system been replenished. I wanted to kind of get a sense from you. How did the Detroit Tigers minor league system get to where it was? Obviously people know that Dave Dombrowski was a wheeler and dealer. He traded a lot of unproven talent for known commodities, but over what you've seen, how did the Tigers minor league system get so desolate? Well, it's because of those trades that Dave Dombrowski did make as trader Dave. I loved him making those deals, but it caused the farm system to become barren. It definitely did. And really it started hugely with the trade for Miguel Cabrera with the now Miami Marlins dealing for him and getting rid of Cameron Mabin and Andrew Miller, the two top prospects in the Tigers' farm system at the time, and it became more and more decimated as they made more and more deals, dealing Jair Jurgens for Edgar Renteria with the Atlanta Braves back in the day as well, trades such as that, but also later when you look at deals that he made for guys such as Anthony Ghost of the Toronto Blue Jays, a deal that failed hugely. It really did for the Detroit Tigers as Anthony Ghost now has become a guy that's trying to make it as a reliever at the big league level. And remember, the Tigers had to get rid of Devin Travis in that deal to land Anthony Ghost, a deal that did not work out at all. And then you look at a deal that he made with the Cincinnati Reds before he got fired, and it was involving Eugenio Suarez. And remember, all the Tigers got in return was the big pasta. And remember what happened with him, Alfredo Simon. He wasn't that good. Didn't turn out to be a good deal for the Tigers. It really exploded in their face. So deals like that and throughout the years, adding those deals up, you know, accounting for them, it's what caused the farm system of the Detroit Tigers to become decimated. And you know what? Rightfully so. It led to victories, a lot of regular season victories, just not enough postseason victories, as we've harped on many times here on Tigers Talk, Doc. What's been your philosophy regarding how a major league ball club should utilize the minors? Because you looked at what the Yankees were able to do, 
And that's an organization, when you looked at what they were able to do in the late 90s, early 2000s, they won a plethora of World Series. And I know people will look to some of the moves that they made in terms of who they brought on, in terms of free agent and their spending. But you look at the core of the Yankees, it was you know established from the minor league system. You know, the core for, for the New York Yankees, arguably one of the best core ever to be assembled in terms of Posada, uh, Derek Jeter. You can help fill me in the other two as well. But the core four for the New York Yankees came up, and they they rode that success for almost a decade. And so the Detroit Tigers, when they decided to make the moves, they didn't go that route. Yes, they had one of the best players to come up as a rookie in Justin Verlander, but primarily that 2006 team was basically built through experienced free agents among a group of veterans as well that helped, you know, that team get over the hump and start to perform really well for the Detroit Tigers. But in terms of how you think, how should a baseball club utilize the minors? And do you think now going forward with what Alavila is tasked to do, do you think he's going to replenish this minor league system for the Tigers in a timely manner? Well, he has started already, Doc, slowly but surely. It is a process, trusted arm process, as the Philadelphia Sixers have done in the NBA. And uh, to more and more success, as we've seen results become more productive now for their NBA squad there in Philly. But back to the Tigers and Major League Baseball and how you can build and build on the fly and replenish your farm system. Well, it is through making deals, such as what? Al Avila has started to do replenishing the Tigers' farm system, which has needed it for a long time. He's finally gotten down to getting this done with the farm system and building it back up to a place where the Tigers can be competitive year in, year out, without having to add big-name, pricey free agents, which Chris Illich, now the son of Mr. I, the guy that's now in charge of the Tigers as the owner of the Detroit Tigers, well, he's probably going to really push Alavila to follow that route for success with the Tigers in terms of building a consistent winning ball club year in, year out, moving forward into 2018, 2019, 2020, and beyond. That is now the key for winning in Motown. It is not going to be, you know, buying the blue chip free agents, okay? They're going to have to go down the discount aisle, right? The clearance aisle and buy a lot of low-tier free agents, guys for cheap at least, and build up their farm system and hope that these homegrown ball players turn out to be highly successful to at least, you know, average ball players. It has to start with that. Having average ball players that you've accumulated. You know, guys become that now in the major leagues, but also you have to hit on a few guys a big time and hope that means that they become all-star players and if not year in year out at least every so often and then hopefully that accumulation of ball players from average to high tier ball players allows you to become a consistent winner and then you add the free agents every so often and then you have a great mixture of talent on your major league ball club that once again allows you to win then pretty much year in year out. That's what the Tigers have to start doing, and I believe they have started to accumulate those kind of ball players through the trades that Al Avila has already made up to this point, Doc. You know, besides Justin Verlander, can you list a couple minor league additions that have come up to the Tigers and contributed? Because many people do believe and maybe have this fallacy that the Tigers just bought the team, but there were some players that have come up and made some noise in the past few seasons, and there's some now that have been acquired that are ready to potentially do some things. I personally do have faith that Alavila has done some things at least to replenish it because for years, for several years, the Tigers minor league system has been ranked so poorly that the Tigers, when it was time to basically, when their run ended, it was tough to kind of keep that train going. Whereas if you had a minor league system with some talent, you could have introduced some of these players maybe two or three years ago. But the Tigers were in a different spot. Honestly, they were in a position to basically, they were trying to continue the winning ways. They were trying to really get to the postseason and make a push in the postseason. So they weren't willing to bring up a bunch of minor league talent. But besides Justin Verlander, anybody else that's been well known to come up through the system in the last maybe decade or so? Well, Nicholas Castellanos. Come on, we love our boy Nick Castellanos, right? Well, he's going to be a big-time contributor, whether or not you like it or love it. I don't love it or like it at all because at this point, with the barren state that the Tigers' major league ball club is in, he's got to be producing and be a middle-of-the-order, consistent run producer. If he is not, they're not going to maybe even come close to winning 70 games in 2018. So he is another guy, I would say, and probably the biggest positional player prospect to come up and to produce in a long, long time. 
So he is that guy you can look at in terms of minor leaguers that have been homegrown that really stick out to me, Doc, in the recent past. And moving forward, once again, he's got to be a big-time contributor to this Major League Ball Club for to come close to looking competitive at the Major League level, Doc. With Nick Castellanos, it's sometimes easy to overlook him because he was a highly ranked individual. Many people do believe that the Tigers maybe could have sold him high based upon the hype that he had. They chose to hold on to him, and based on his production in terms of defense, now you've seen him shift to the outfield based upon his really his defensive liabilities at third base. So I kind of feel like with Nick Castellanos, you might have had an opportunity to flip him based upon the hype. I do believe a few seasons back when other GMs would call the Tigers, one of the names that would always be thrown in there was Nick Castellanos, and I do feel like you might have missed an opportunity to really help your ball club in terms of restocking that minor league system by holding on to Nick Castellanos because when you look at what he actually turned into, one of the strengths that Dave Dombrowski was able to do was when he traded the prospects, nobody really came to bite us in the butt. I mean, Andrew Miller now, but he had to go through almost a decade of you know struggles in order to become the Andrew Miller that he is now. Everybody else that Dave Dombrowski has traded has really been a bust. And so that's the art of being a general manager is knowing when to get rid of a guy. And I feel like by holding on to Nick Castellanos, I do believe that, you know, we've talked about his potential. I just don't think that based upon what he's going to produce in the future, I think you could have got a lot of prospects and maybe even an everyday talented individual for Nick Castellanos. And that's the that's the job of the general manager is to know when to trade these pieces. And right now in the minor league system, I'm pretty impressed with the arms. I think that, by all accounts, has been the strength right now in the minor league system with Bo Burrows, Matt Manning, among a plethora of arms that they continue to acquire in the minor league system. And now they got the number one pick, and there's talk of adding more arms. So it is fascinating in terms of the Tigers and their use of the minors, but did you agree with Dave Dombrowski in the way that he did it, or would you say that it was a weakness in terms of just letting everybody go and kind of going in that approach? Because... Now you have a situation where maybe Alavila in two or three years might be in that same spot where you get to around 80, 90 wins. You got these arms that are still kind of getting training in the minor leagues. Do you think that the Tigers should go the route of the Yankees and find that foursome, fivesome of talent and bring them up? Or do you say kind of ride it out and go through a couple of bad seasons, get some draft picks, and then when it's time, buy again, like in 2006? Do you repeat the history or do you go the route via the Yankees? Well, I do believe in foursomes and fivesomes, but for the Tigers' sake, too, looking at Nick Castellanos, first and foremost, by the way, he had to hold on to somebody, but it's when do you hold them and when do you deal with, deal them? And I think he did, for the most part, deal the prospects at the right time before they busted. Like, he knew when to deal them and to get good Major League talent in return for these pieces before they busted. So I think he was, most of the time, on the right side of when to deal the prospect, and for the Tigers' sake... They accumulated a plethora of high-quality Major League talent because of his willingness to deal prospects and, once again, won a lot of regular season ball games. It's just it didn't always translate to postseason success and to the pinnacle, right, of postseason success, which is claiming a fall classic. Tigers still looking for their first World Series championship since 1984. But I still believe that I think he went about things the right way, tried to accumulate talent by dealing his prospects and dealing them, for the most part, when it was time to deal the prospects before they busted once again. And you look at another guy I forgot to bring up that he dealt with was a high tier blue chipper in terms of a farm system hand at one point. Jacob Turner is a guy to bring up who he dealt to the Marlins, another deal with the Marlins for Anibal Sanchez. How darn good was Anibal for a while won the 2013 American League ERA title. This guy was really good. Turner never panned out with the Marlins or anybody else that he ended up with. I believe he's back now with the Marlins on a minor league deal. That's how much he has busted and flamed out since being dealt to the Marlins to get Anibal Sanchez. So for the most part, Dave Dombrowski landed a lot of high-quality major league talent by dealing these prospects and by dealing them at the right time. So I would have gone about things the way that Dave D, Trader Dave, did do so with the Tigers. Okay, now when you survey the landscape in the minor leagues, are you impressed? Do they got more work to do? Because it seems like when everybody talks about the Tigers minor league system, it seems like that everybody knows they got to kind of restock the bullpen. They got to restock infield position players in terms of having guys available should the starting nine not do well at the major league club. Well, yeah, because you look at now replacing Ian Kinsler, right? Most 
uh, noteworthy as that. Who's going to replace him? Is it Dixon Machado? How sustainable is his production going to be on a starting basis at the major league level, playing second base? I don't know if he's good enough to make it full time at second base. So you got to look at those guys who are going to fill those voids that they're about to replace or are bound to replace or already have. And some of those guys just simply won't pan out that are maybe ready to get to the majors or have been toying around at the major league level prior, such as Dixon Machado, and that's what you have to worry about, but also you know they're going to lose a ton of ball games anyways, and they're worried about really more about going broke and losing a lot to garner that number one pick in the 2019 Major League Baseball amateur draft as well. But you're right, it's about finding those positional player prospects too now that can fill the voids, you know, aptly fill the voids at the major league level, Doc. Okay, so... Are you saying that the Tigers in 2018, 2019 should maybe even speed up some of these guys? Because you remember the likes of Jeremy Bonderman. You remember the likes of some arms that maybe came up a little too soon and got rocked. And that's the kind of fine line that we have to look at is you don't want to bring up a guy too soon because if he struggles, then his confidence may wane and you might not get the right guy because this is not the Red Wings. This is the Detroit Tigers. And sometimes you do need a couple of seasons in the minors to get adjusted. And one name that we'll tease in terms of how the Tigers utilized him was Joe Jimenez. I do think the fans wanted him up a lot faster. And then when we got him up here, he wasn't able to deliver. But we'll talk about him next. And I want to talk to you about a great article by Jason Beck, MLB.com writer. Um, He's got five narratives for the Detroit Tigers. We'll go through them, get your thoughts, and then we'll get out of here on this edition of Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company. And we'll be right back here on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc, we love Marty Dobek and the Detroit Sports Commission. And since 01, the Detroit Sports Commission has applied its expert touch to marketing and to selling the Metro Detroit area as a marquee destination for regional, national, and international amateur sporting events. And through the Detroit Sports Commission's help, these events have attracted thousands of visitors and pumped millions, I mean millions of dollars, into our local economy. It is why Detroit is now not only the place where champions are made, but also the place where championships are played. To find out more about the Detroit Sports Commission and all of the events they are bringing to our very region, please follow the DSC on Twitter and on Instagram at DET Sports, and make sure to check out their final website at DetroitSports.org. Back here on Tiger Stock with Sherco and Company, the first 2018 edition of the podcast, alongside the Doc from Doc and Jockey, is back in the studio as usual with me in the warm confines of our Sterling Heights studio. And before the break, you had sagged a conversation piece about Joe Jimenez, whether or not the Tigers rushed him, and we all wanted him, though. So it's hard to say they totally rushed him because all the fans did, the pundits, if you include us, are we pundits now? I think we are. We've done enough of these Tiger Stock episodes. And I know me for one, Doc, I wanted him up. Uh, at the end of 2016, I still remember guys talking about it. Tony Paul, I believe, was talking about it. I mean, like heavily credible guys that write about the Tigers and report about the Tigers. And I was right there on the bandwagon as well in terms of calling him up. They didn't then. They called him up in 2017 and to very poor results. Exactly. And that's one of the things that is really tough for a general manager is that because of the fact that the Tigers bullpen struggled so much, we just wanted to see a guy do anything. And then when we came up, you saw, oh, he only's got one pitch that he can command, and that's the fastball. And that was inconsistent at best. A guy like Jimenez, though, was really an enigma because when he'd go back down to the minors, he would dominate. So it was tough because how much more would you allow him to go through? And he had that uh, famed scoreless streak going on. He was able to do some things in the minors. So it was just kind of one of those classic 4A situations where he was really good for the minors. People didn't think that he was going to get much better performing there. But when he came up to the big leagues, He just struggled because he recognized that, oh, I need more secondary pitches because once these hitters get film on you, they can hit fastballs. They can hit fastballs even at 103 miles an hour. They'll lock in. These are professional hitters. So you got to, you know, perfect the art of pitching and utilize secondary pitches as well. But I'm fascinated to see how Jimenez is utilized this year because that bullpen is going to be retooled and he's going to be a focal point, hopefully, if he starts the year with the big club. You get a sense if he's going to start the year with the big club? I think he has to because they're so darn desperate. I mean, who else do they have? You and I maybe throwing in the bullpen? I mean, there's not many guys to pull out of the bullpen that can be successful or even close to effective. So I would think Jimenez gets a shot and should because, once again, how about the optics of this? If he doesn't make the big league ball club out of spring training, how bad does that look for Joe Jimenez and this Tigers organization, Doc? 
Exactly. All right. So looking at this article from Jason Beck, he's got obviously, you know, years of experience writing, a really good writer. I enjoy his work. So he's got some narratives that are going to be looked at for the foreseeable future in 2018. And here's the first one, obviously, like we've talked about. Number one, can Cabrera and Jordan Zimmerman stay healthy? Obviously, the Tigers are a better team if those two guys are producing. But, you know, Miguel Cabrera is 364 hits shy of 3,000. He can be a good hitter, but he has to stay healthy. And last year's season was marred through injuries. And whenever you use that word back, it makes you a little bit concerned. And then Jordan Zimmerman uh, kind of has been a bust in his He has been a tri- bust. Not kind of, right? Has been a clear-cut bust. Exactly. So, can Cabrera and Jordan Zimmerman stay healthy this year, 2018? Hell no. I mean, you could say you can go out on a limb and try to be bold here and say yes. But I'm going to say no to both. Now, yes to one out of the two, but the question is both, right? Staying healthy? Yeah. Correct? I'm going to say no. How about you? Zimmerman made 29 starts in 2017, but averaged just over five innings a start and posted a 6.08 ERA, 5.1 FIP, while yielding a major league baseball high 108 earned runs. You got to have a lot better for what you're paying that guy. And it's a big narrative because you've let go of Verlander. You let go now of Anibal Sanchez. You need somebody to eat innings. And you hope that this veteran kind of turns it around. I think both of us probably have a little bit more trust in Miguel Cabrera. But Jordan Zimmerman has to produce. I mean, it's the third year of the five-year contract. You got to do more things because three more seasons, if he struggles, it's going to be an albatross. It's going to be a big problem. Well, Doc, it's almost more vital for Zimmerman to perform better in 2018 than Miguel Cabrera because the Tigers have some hitters that can sustain some kind of success in the middle of that order, especially if Jamer Candelario, who I just love. I bring him up all the time now, but I'm really banking on him being successful at the plate as he was down the stretch for the Tigers. And I think he can be a big-time contributor because of that, along with Nick Castellanos, maybe Mikey Matuk. So Zimmerman has to bounce back heavily because how about the guys that they have in that rotation aren't very good at throwing innings, too. Zimmerman now has that kind of rep as well, but he's a veteran arm, has thrown the innings in the past before 2017, before 2016, really, with the Nationals. And he's got to get back to that, to being that guy that can throw six innings. Because really, they're looking for right now a veteran type in that rotation that can throw innings. They need that out of Jordan Zimmerman in 2018. But am I going to bank on that happening from Jay Zim? I'm going to say no. Narrative number two. If Michael Fulmer is healthy, are his days in Detroit numbered? Major concerns. You know, Adam and I had this debate. I kind of changed his opinion because I kind of felt like if you're going to retool, it's probably going to be five or six years before you're even looking at a potential World Series opportunity. So that'll be right in the middle of Michael Fulmer's prime. People have debated it back and forth regarding how much Michael Fulmer is going to contribute this year and in coming years, and is it worth it to keep him versus, you know, letting him go and, and acquiring a bunch of talent. But in your mind, are you concerned at all regarding his health? And do you think he finishes 2018 with the Tigers? I think he will finish 2018 with the Tigers. And I don't think he'll stay healthy, though, the whole entire season. I think he might even miss some time to start the year because of, you know, this past season, what he went through injury-wise. So who even knows if he'll be fully ready for the start of 2018 at this point, Doc? Beck writes, he turns 25 in March and has five seasons to go before free agency. But the difficulty and the challenges, you know, of the rebuilding project is... Fulmer's potential value to other teams, it makes it really hard because he's 25. You have him under team control. That's a player you want. And when you go out there in five years, you're going to probably want a guy like Michael Fulmer. But are you willing to be patient with him, knowing that at any moment that arm could be shot and you could be facing a a year-long injury situation? You could facing... You could also face, you have to think about it, a career-ending situation if the arm, because remember, his mechanics are violent, and a lot of general managers did note that he might be injury-prone, and you might be now in a situation similar to what we talked about in that you might have missed the window to get the max value now knowing in, in a year or two if he does struggle with arm injuries, then you got a guy you can't trade. But he's still such a sexy commodity, and I use the word sexy and throw it around for a guy like Michael Fulmer because he's under club control, perhaps in the heart of his prime, maybe not even in his peak years of Major League success yet. As you can say, a player reaches his peak at 27 years and can go until about 32 in his peak years. So he might not even have reached truly the prime and the best years of his Major League Baseball career yet, as that might be when he turns 27. So that's why right now you could deal him for a lot as well. And that's the tough thing that the Tigers are dealing with, whether or not to deal him because of how much value he could bring back in return for himself at this point, and probably is just a hair or two, as in a year or two off from being inside his peak years, when he could be reaching his highest level of Major League production, Doc. 
Narrative number three, what does the future hold for Victor Martinez, a player that everybody talks about? We've talked about him here on the podcast, but uh, 39 years old. He's thinking that he's got a lot more left in the tank. The Tigers definitely need him to get back into form. Obviously, he's not going to be that fast on the base pads, but if he can make contact, if he can do some things and help this team contribute, that takes the pressure off of Miguel Cabrera, takes the pressure off of Nick Castellanos. But the future for Victor Martinez is tough because of his age, his heart situation, and due to the fact that the season that he had in 2017 was a little bit revealing in terms of what's his role as a leader for this team. Should Victor Martinez take a a larger leadership role because it seemed like it might have rubbed Verlander and some of the other non-foreign players the wrong way. He looked downtrodden by injuries, wasn't the same at the plate because of the injuries probably and his age. He's no longer in the prime of his career whatsoever, even close to his prime, and probably should just retire. You can't tell a player what to do, but wouldn't you tell him to retire? If you were the GM, the manager, you would look at him into the face as a man, man to man, and say, Vimar, your best years are well behind you. So at this point, why are you playing? We're not going to win in 2018. You're coming back for one more season to toy around as a non-premium slugger. I don't think it's worth it for Vimar, and you can't expect a lot out of him production-wise in 2018, Doc. Narrative number four, is Nick Castellanos the next big Detroit Tigers bat? Um, Jason Beck notes that no Tiger since Curtis Granderson 10 years ago put up the production that he had. 26 homers, 36 doubles, 10 triples, and 101 RBIs. The Tigers have him under contract for a couple more seasons. Um, His production in 2018 could definitely be something that could help the Tigers if he is a player that does well. And similar to Miguel Cabrera, could be another trade chip that you utilize going forward because I do believe that if he's that productive, if he can maybe add to that production, you can trade him for some more talented individuals maybe in the bullpen or infield position players. You're right, Doc. Maybe flip him. Maybe do so because if he has a big gear, that's a big-time trade chip you have to work with. So I could see them dealing Nicholas Castellanos if that's the case too, Doc. Jason Beck has covered the Tigers for Major League Baseball since 2002. Read his work at MLB.com. Follow him on Twitter at Beck Jason. His fifth narrative, like we talked about, and it wraps it up nicely for this podcast. Number five, when do the next batch of prospects arrive? Uh, Tigers fans caught a glimpse of the future down the stretch when Jamer Candelario at third base kind of showed some things. Jacoby Jones played out in center field. Joe Jimenez uh, in the bullpen, Zach Reininger. Um, some of the prospects that have come up haven't, you know, been that successful, but you got prospects all across the minors and everybody's waiting to see when does Alavila pull the trigger. And we talked about it, but at the same time, there are some players that are going to be drafted. I think Fiedo might be somebody that comes up rather quickly. Manning Burroughs are highly rated, but like we talked about, when does the next batch of prospects show up at Comerica Park so we can go see and evaluate? But you know what, Doc? All those guys that you just named from Jason Beck's article, all of those guys, the only guy that I really liked from 2017 based on his production in 2017 down the stretch was Jamie Candelario. Jacoby Jones, Stinko. Joe Jimenez got lit up, was horrible. I mean, all those guys right there that you named up after Jamer didn't do anything of high quality or of quality in 2017. So what can you expect from them in 2018? I'm looking forward to other guys coming up and being productive, such as Franklin Perez, a guy like that who might be around midseason. Uh, Bo Burroughs, maybe by midseason. Matt Manning by midseason or the end of the season. So you got guys like that, arms to watch out for that could be productive in 2018. Exactly. And so for you, do you pay attention more in terms of the minor leagues to triple A, double A, or do you go all the way down to single A in terms of watching this this talent? How should a guy like me, a guy that doesn't peek into the minors too much, I know you're a baseball geek and you read everything and you check out the athletic, you check out the free, you check out all the great work of your colleagues, but a guy like me, where is a good spot to kind of educate myself about the minors? Because if I'm going to go to Toledo, I got to kind of keep up with the likes of you. Well, go to Emily Walden from The Athletic. But double A and triple A, in terms of the levels of baseball to watch out for these guys, for I would say double A and triple A are the ones, the levels of baseball to really check out closely, Doc. Double A and triple uh, A? I would say single A, you'll see some prospects, top flight guys too, that start off their minor league. And it's professional baseball, by the way. You know that, right? Isn't that something? How those guys are considered professional baseball players. Even though they're in the minors, they're minor leaguers, but they are professional ball players. Okay, so what are you keeping up to date with in uh, the new year, 2018? What, what should we pay attention to going forward in the next couple of weeks here on the Tigers Talk podcast? Whether or not I ever get a girlfriend, uh, that's by the end of 2018. But for the Tigers' sake, what are they going to do? Are they going to make another move, a shrewd move, low-cost move? 
What do you think? Because I'm thinking they're going to add something to the bullpen by the end of this offseason. So I'm awaiting that to happen from the Tigers. Okay, and then we could also look into Al Avila, Ron Garden, hire some of the moves that have been made, maybe feature some of the minor league talent that we did talk about on this episode. So it's going to be a fun time. Um, you know, you're our baseball guy. I enjoy your work at the Free Press and at DetroitSportsPodcast.com. You can follow Vito on Twitter at Vito Jerome, and he's here every single Wednesday. Hasn't taken no time off in terms of talking about the Detroit Tigers. And, uh, you know, pretty soon, it's, it comes quick, Vito. We'll have to start our predictions because I think that uh, it's time for us to kind of start looking at the season and say, where are the clubs going to shake out in 2018? Because we all know that in the Central, the Tigers probably aren't going to be Club 1 or 2. That's for sure. But I look forward to your previews. I look forward to some features and maybe some guests as well going forward in 2018. It's going to be a fun ride because on the field at Comerica Park, that's going to be challenging to kind of pick apart because we see a lot of losses ahead. But I do think that, like we've said in previous podcasts, when we get a chance to evaluate some some of the growth of some of these players, it could be a fun time. Really quick, you know, a guy that we should really preview and talk about expectations for is, I think, the best edition of this offseason by Alavila thus far outfielder Leonis Martin. He's a guy to check out for because he's a guy that I don't think will stink in 2018 of the Tigers' major leaguers to look at. Let's look at him next week or in the near future here on Tigers Talk Doc. Will do. Let's get out of here. Have a good week, everybody. Look forward to next Wednesday. Each and every week, Vito brings the noise and talks baseball on the Tigers Talk podcast, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Happy New Year once again, everybody out there, and adios.